Okay. So um, I'd like to thank uh, our friend Eliezer for inviting me to give this talk. I feel very honored to be here. And um, well, uh, David is not uh, here. Okay, I will show it later. So my talk uh, is uh, motivated by two problems which are related. One is the black hole information paradox, and a related question is uh, what happens in the black hole interior. And <coughs> I will try to explain the connection between the two. And um, then I will review uh, the role of uh, two principles. One is uh, the idea of complementarity and the other of state dependence. Uh, the role of these principles for a possible resolution of, the, of this problem. And uh, finally, I, if I have time, I will try to present uh, some work in progress, uh, which uh, will be a toy model uh, realizing these ideas to some extent. So uh, my talk will be based on work with Sivat Raju and with uh, these people, uh, which is their ongoing work. Um, so we heard a very beautiful talk uh, by Andy this, this morning about the information paradox, but I would like to make some additional comments. So the problem is that the Hogg computation predicts uh, uh, thermal radiation. Uh, but of course, uh, and this seems to violate unitarity, but of course uh, the Hawking computation is a semi-classical computation and we expect quantum corrections. And then the question we want to address is whether small corrections can in principle unitarize the radiation. Notice that I have emphasized the word in principle because uh, here I'm not asking the harder question, which is how do we explicitly calculate these corrections, uh, which is a very difficult problem, as difficult as computing an, S an exact S matrix in quantum gravity, which is certainly beyond reach right now. Uh, so, uh, uh, the fact that the uh, answer to this question is positive um, can be understood from very basic properties in statistical mechanics, namely that uh, pure and mixed states look very similar in, in large quantum systems. In particular, you can prove that if you have a large quantum system and for more states, pure states, and for simple observables, the expectation values uh, on the pure state are very close to the mixed uh, state expectation value. Of course, this equation is not true when we start considering complicated observables. For instance, uh, if you consider uh, uh, an endpoint function of many simple operators, then you can show that the estimate of the error, uh, the, the error grows. And if the number of insertion is comparable to the entropy of the system, then this approximation is not good, which means that you can start detecting the purity of the state when you measure complicated correlators. Now, in terms of the Hawking process, what this means is that, in principle, uh, we can imagine a, a unitarizing the Hawking radiation uh, while introducing small corrections to uh, simple observables, for example, two-point functions, three-point functions between uh, the outgoing photons. But at the same time, we need to introduce large corrections when we consider a very large number of photons of the, where the number is of the order of the entropy of the black hole. And it is in these correlators where the inf information of the pure state is, uh, is uh, stored. So, so far, this looks good. But uh, as you probably uh, know, uh, more recently, uh, another aspect of the problem has been uh, emphasized, which has to do with the entanglement of quantum fields on the horizon. And this problem seems harder to resolve by uh, invoking small corrections. So here the statement is uh, that uh, the, uh, the outgoing Hawking particles have to be entangled with the uh, earlier radiation in order for the information to escape. And at the same time, they have to be entangled with their partners in the interior in order for the horizon to be smooth, which seems to violate uh, the monogamy of entanglement. And um, uh, in fact, uh, Matur has, um, pr has formulated the theorem that small corrections cannot change this picture and that this paradox persists even if you include uh, small corrections. Another intuitive argument which seems to suggest that uh, the smoothness of the horizon is, uh, is, uh, may, not be, may not be true has to do with uh, the fact that uh, in order for the horizon to be smooth, we need to have very specific entanglement between the modes on the two sides of the horizon. What this means is that we not only want the amount of entanglement to be fixed, but we want the details of entanglement to be very specific. For example, even the phases of the coefficients in the entangled state uh, have to be fixed if we want the horizon to be smooth. And it's very hard to understand from the point of view of statistical mechanics why uh, in a typical pure state uh, we would end up with a correct and specific entanglement uh, between these, these particles. For example, those phases would, would be uh, random, randomly distributed according to statistical mechanics. So um, now a natural question is whether we can study this problem in the framework of a... Yeah, I think this argument is probably stronger when we look at, black, for example, black holes in ADS, where we can form them by collapse, but then we can wait for a very long time, and we can keep throwing stuff into the black hole, so we can really reach a typical state. So, um, now the question is, can we study this problem in ADS-CFT? And uh, when we look at the space-time behind the horizon of a black hole in ADS, it's pretty clear that you need two sets of modes, the left movers and the right movers. 
And these guys, the left movers, have a direct meaning in the cosmology <coughs> theory. They're uh, single trace operators in the CFT, while uh, it is more mysterious to understand the origin of the guys who are coming from, uh, from inside the black hole. Uh, you may be tempted to uh, try to calculate these uh, modes by using uh, the equations of motions and propagating them to the past and through the collapsing matter. But uh, this problem, uh, as you know, suffers from uh, Transplankian issues because the, the, these modes are highly blue shifted. But even if you are skeptical about this argument, there is a, a, a new argument which is more general and has been formulated by uh, Amses and uh, Marov and Polczynski. Uh, which uh, indicates that uh, these operators cannot possibly exist in the CFT if we insist that typical states are, are, are smooth. And here is the argument. Um, now, uh, these operators, these modes which are behind the horizon, have uh, effectively have negative energy with respect to the boundary Hamiltonian. So the commutator of these operators with the CFT Hamiltonian has a minus sign relative to the modes that you would have on uh, the exterior of the horizon. So if you demand that these operators exist and reproduce a smooth interior for typical states in the conformal field theory, then using this equation and very simple uh, manipulations, for example, using the canonical computation relations between uh, these operators and the cyclicity of the trace, you can arrive at this result, which is inconsistent, that the occupation level of the modes behind the hori horizon would have to be negative. So this is an inconsistency which indicates that these operators cannot possibly be defined uh, in such a way that they obey this algebra and they act in the correct way on typical states of the conformal field theory. So uh, this argument uh, is a refinement of the uh, original uh, Fargo and uh, Matur paradox about the black hole, and it has now been phrased purely within IDSFT as a concrete question about the existence of certain operators. And as I tried to explain in the previous slide, there is an argument that these operators cannot possibly exist in the CFT. Now, if this is true, then uh, it would imply that most states of the conformal field theory in the deconfined phase are dual to a black hole in the bulk with a singular horizon, uh, which would be somewhat uh, okay, disappointing, maybe. Um, and then the question... I define most uh, by using the Haar measure. I take uh, states of a given energy in, in the microcanonical ensemble, and I define a typical state using the Haar measure within that ensemble. Well, it would be almost all of them. I mean, mo uh, when I say most, I mean the vast majority of states would be, would be a typical state would be singular. But you can't give a quantitative measure of um, Okay, I would have to think a little bit about it, but it would really be the vast majority of states. So the question is, can we find a way uh, around this, this paradox, uh, which I remind you has been completely formulated within ADSFT. So it is defined, uh, it is a paradox that has to do with a basic framework of ADSFT. And uh, here I want to uh, review very quickly. Yeah. Can I ask a, yes. About that if, if I'm not thinking about eigenstates, mm -hmm. then in fact you, you pick some typical state and then the Hamiltonian acts on it. Yes. And if I, I'm in a black hole, I'm going to be exploring mm -hmm. in a fairly short time a, a lot of states. And so I should expect that anything that I measure is going to be measured in some time-average density matrix. So... Um, yeah, well, this argument uh, was phrased for a typical pure state. Sorry? This argument uh, was phrased uh, in terms of typical pure states. Well, okay. But you can also apply directly on the density matrix, because uh, the only uh, ingredients of this argument... The people you mean, uh, uh, the Joe and I, I'm not sure if that is true. Uh, l let me get a little bit. But even in that case, it's not very clear. If uh, even for the thermophile state, it's not clear to me whether they 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 they, th they think it's, it's yeah. smooth or not. I've been told by them that they think it's okay. Uh, okay, I will come back to your question when I talk about the thermophile state. Okay, so uh, now I want to briefly uh, review a proposal that uh, we made with uh, Suvat Razu a few years ago, which um, in, so in some way can avoid this paradox. And uh, the basic intuition is that if we take a, a typical state in the conformal field theory with, uh, from the deconfined phase, we expect that uh, at late times the state will thermalize. 
which means that correlate correlators of single trace operators on the state will be very close to thermal correlators. Now, this statement is true uh, only for simple observables, so where the number of insertions is very small compared to capital N. And of course, this makes sense from the general point of view because um, we can understand thermalization of a pure state only when we can talk about a small algebra of observables. Uh, if we have access to all observables of the system, then it does not make sense to talk about thermalization because you can really determine the state at once. So uh, in a large NGS theory, there's a very natural uh, definition of a, a, um, of a small algebra, which is uh, defined by the fact that we have a small number of single trace operators. So if you take a small number of single trace operators, you multiply them together, you, gen you effectively generate a small algebra, which is naturally defined in a large NGS theory with holographic dual. So um, what I want to emphasize now is the intuition that even though we are in a single conformal field theory and in a pure state, this small algebra uh, uh, of single trace operators, when it probes the state, it, uh, it, pro it perceives the state as, as if it were an entangled state. You can understand this statement by remembering that uh, correlators in the typical pure state are very close to thermal correlators, which in turn can be uh, calculated by using this thermophilic doubled state, which is uh, uh, a formalism where we introduce a fictitious second copy of the conformal field theory and we place the two CFTs in a thermal state. Now, uh, what this means intuitively is that um, that uh, we have this small algebra in the conformal field theory which seems to thermalize even though we're in a pure state. And uh, th the meaning is that uh, th the, the large number of degrees of freedom, the order n squared degrees of freedom of the conformal field theory play the role of the heat bath for the small algebra. So um, what this means is, is that we have an isolated system in a pure state, we let it evolve, we have a small algebra, and uh, at, after a certain amount of time, this algebra seems to be entangled with another part of the system which is characterized by these degrees of freedom. Then, uh, whatever operators, uh, the, so we take our single trace operators and we look what are the operators within this heat bath that they're entangled with. And we select those operators as the O tilde operators representing the space time behind the horizon. Of course, this is an intuitive uh, explanation and uh, I would like to write down a more concrete mathematical formula. So the question is how do we identify these operators concretely? And uh, I will present it in the next slide. Uh, but the key property that we will use, the key algebraic property, is that this small algebra cannot annihilate the typical pure state. So the statement, statement is if you take a, 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 a typical state in the gauge theory at, at uh, high energies and you act on it with a small number of single trace operators, you will not be able to annihilate the state. Used this statement, um, we, 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 we end up with a, a very specific mathematical problem. We have a, an algebra acting on a state with a property that it cannot annihilate the state. And then it's a, it is a general fact that uh, the representation of this algebra uh, acting on the Hilbert space is reducible and the, al the algebra has a non-trivial commutant. So uh, what this means is that uh, we can define a, a set of operators acting on the same Hilbert space with a property that they commute with all operators of the algebra that we started with. And in fact, there is a very canonical mathematical construction which is um, uh, in important in the theory of operator algebras, which gives you an algorithm of how to calculate uh, these uh, operators belonging to the commutant of the algebra. So uh, this psi is the state that we started with. A is any operator from the algebra, that we, the small algebra. And we define some, uh, an antilinear map and uh, it's square. And via these relations, we define a, a set of operators O tilde. And you can prove that these operators have the property that they commute with the operators that we started with and also that they're entangled with them. Moreover, they ent they're entangled in precisely the way that we need in order to reconstruct the smooth interior uh, of the black hole. Namely, the two-point functions between O and O tilde are precisely the ones that you need in order to reconstruct a smooth horizon. Now, uh, let me make some comments. Uh, this operator that I introduced, this delta, uh, is a positive Hermitian operator, and you can write it as the exponential of a Hermitian operator. And this operator K is called the modular Hamiltonian for the, for the small algebra. And if you use the large expansion and the KMS condition, you can prove that uh, this uh, modular Hamiltonian um, is proportional to the CFT Hamiltonian with a factor of the temperature and uh, by additive shift where E naught is the energy of the state. Okay, so this is a somewhat formal construction. And if you follow it through, the, uh, uh, what you get uh, as a more practical definition of these operators is a set of linear equations which define for you how these operators O tilde act on the state that we started with, and also on any state that you get by acting with a small number of single trace operators and then acting with O tilde. 
So this set of equations uh, is the output of the general mathematical construction which I described before. Now, uh, these uh, equations define the operators of tilde not on the entire Hilbert space of the conformal theory, but rather on a subspace, which is characterized by uh, taking the, uh, CFT, the, the, the state psi of the black hole and acting on it with, uh, any, uh, with a number of um, uh, single trace operators. So this small Hilbert space, uh, from the bulk point of view, has the interpretation as the Hilbert space of all effective theory excitations that you can construct on top of a given black hole state psi. Now, the fact that these equations uh, have a solution is, is somewhat non-trivial. So these are linear equations, but uh, it's not immediately obvious that they always have a solution. And in fact, uh, the, the fact that there is a solution is related to the fact that uh, uh, this algebra of single trace operators cannot annihilate the state. For instance, if you try to repeat this process um, around the vacuum, the ground set of the CFT, the process would fail, and you would not be able to define this operator of tilde, which is a good thing, of course, because we do not expect any region behind the horizon when we're studying the vacuum. OK. Now, uh, now we have defined these operators, and uh, we can write down an operator on the conformal field theory by combining the usual single trace operators and these new guys, or tilde, and multiplying them with appropriate wave functions. And uh, in this way, you can define an operator which depends on the coordinates of ADS. And then you can uh, start calculating correlation functions of these guys on the black hole microstate. And it, by construction, it is guaranteed that these correlation functions will, will reproduce the correlation functions of effective theory on a, on a black hole background. And in particular, uh, the horizon of the black hole will turn out to be smooth. Now, um, as an aside, I, would, I want to mention that uh, this construction is uh, rather compatible and related to the ERAPR proposal by Maldacena and Saskind, in the sense that uh, if you uh, slightly extend the definitions which I gave in the previous slides in a very natural way, uh, so that they work in a situation where you have two entangled systems, uh, the construction reproduces the physics of, of uh, ERAPR. Namely, if you uh, take two conformal field theories in the thermal field state, and you apply this construction, which I, which I described, you, you reproduce the wormhole that we know, like the eternal black hole in ADS. While if you uh, apply the same construction on a typical state, uh, where uh, the amount of entanglement is the same, but the details are different, uh, what you will rec reconstruct are two disconnected uh, uh, space times, or perhaps you can think of them as two space times connected by a very long wormhole. Yeah. Yes, I will come to it. Yeah, so here I, 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 I'm basically showing that it is possible to find operators with the desired properties. But you're absolutely right that uh, for a deeper understanding, we would have to identify what is the principle which selects these operators. A and I will come to it in a little bit. Now, uh, now I would like to explain why these operators were able to uh, uh, evade the, 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 the arguments which that we started with, which against the existence of a smooth interior. As you can see from these equations, these operators depend on the, on the state psi. These equations explicitly depend on the state that we start with. And um, so for a given microstate psi, and if you consider all uh, excitations around that microstate, uh, which is defined as the Hilbert space eight of psi, then these operators or tilde are, are well defined as linear operators on that subspace. However, if you start looking at different black hole microstates and you try to combine them together, you cannot promote these operators into globally defined operators acting on the entire Hilbert space of the theory. Now, the fact that these operators depend on the state um, solves the problems that which I mentioned before. For example, it solves this uh, negative occupancy uh, paradox um, uh, because uh, if, you, if the operator tilde depends on the state, then it is not meaningful to take the trace. Uh, it's not meaningful to use the same operator on many different states and sum over them. So this, qu this quantity is not really meaningful. Oh, so yes, that's right. Or yes, that's right. Second, uh, which I think is rather nice, it solves this this paradox or this conflict between um, chaos and entanglement in a very natural way. Remember, the problem was that it was very hard to understand how typical states could end up with a correct entanglement. But here, what we're doing is that we're selecting the operators by the entanglement. So in a, it's almost a tautology that you always end up with a correct uh, entanglement because the operators are themselves selected by the entanglement. But of course, uh, this construct, the the having operators which depend on the state is rather unusual in quantum mechanics, and it definitely deserves further study. 
in particular, uh, there are some arguments that uh, if you try to um, use state dependence in such a way that uh, even typical uh, states are, uh, are smooth, then state dependence leads to observable violations of the Born rule. What this means uh, in practice is that uh, you can find two states, psi1 and psi2 in the Hilbert space, with a property that the state vectors are very nearby as, as vectors in the Hilbert space, uh, even though the physical interpretation of the state is, fi is, 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 is orthogonal. For example, psi1 could be a state which has a smooth horizon, while psi2 could be a state with horizon with an additional particle on top of it. An example of such states uh, are uh, the ones that you get by starting with a, uh, with a smooth state psi and rotating the phases of the, of the, of the Hartle-Hogan state by where uh, n omega is the number operator for the Schwarzschild modes outside the horizon. So this operator uh, rotates the phase of uh, um, the Hartle-Hogan state. Um, I mean, uh, different... Um, so the Hartle-Hogan state is, a, is an entangled state where oscillators of the field are, are entangled on many different occupation levels. And this operator changes the phase of these levels in a, in a, in a different way, right? So uh, if you do naive effective field theory and you uh, try to understand what is the meaning of the state from the bulk point of view, uh, the, the interpretation would be that the state is, uh, has an excitation on the horizon. So uh, this is a, a problem that I do not have a fully satisfactory answer to. Uh, there are three possibilities. Either uh, we do indeed have firewalls for typical states, but perhaps states which are formed by gravitational collapse are, are smooth. Another possibility is that uh, we have to accept this uh, violation of the Born rule and somehow we have to generalize quantum mechanics for the infalling observer. But what I believe is the answer, though I cannot really uh, justify it now fully, is that uh, these violations are not really observable. And uh, in fact, these two states uh, are actually both uh, physically equivalent. In particular, they're both smooth. So I'm very happy to talk about it in private if you want. But... Um, uh, so this is not a settled, I do not, we do not have the full answer, but uh, I think this will turn out to be the correct uh, uh, possibility. So, uh, now if you are skeptical about state dependence, I would like to give you the most robust argument in favor of it, which is related to the eternal black hole. And uh, the eternal black hole is, uh, well, a black hole that most, most people agree that it is smooth. And uh, if you accept that the, thermophil the eternal black hole, which is dual to the thermophile state, of the two CFTs, if you accept this, uh, this is a, a smooth, uh, has a smooth horizon, then you can act with uh, a one-sided time shift, which is generated by this operator, and which can be understood as a as a large diffeomorphism with the bulk, which only shifts one side of the of the wormhole, and in this way you can generate a very large class of states by taking the parameter t to be very large. So in this way you end up with a, a large family of states, with the expectation that all of them have a smooth interior, and then you can ask the question. Can we find state-independent operators which describe space-time in this region for the entire class of states? And in this paper, we in a paper with Suvrat, we showed that uh, this is not possible, and that even in this within this restricted class of states, uh, if you want all of them to be smooth, you really need to invoke state dependence. And um, so, uh, in my opinion, this is a very strong evidence in favor of state dependence because the only other alternatives that we have are that uh, we have to accept that the eternal black hole does not have a smooth horizon, or perhaps that um, the, this uh, um, idea that the two-sided uh, uh, CFT is dual to, an, to a single space-time is somehow wrong, and there have been some proposals about uh, having to introduce additional degrees of freedom. For example, Marov and Wall have this proposal, which I do not fully understand. Or the third possibility is that the black hole interior does, operators do indeed depend on the state. Okay, let me summarize now about state dependence. Uh, if you accept it, then it solves the, fi the firewall paradox, and um, it provides a step towards the reconstruction of the black hole interior in ADSFT. However, it's really a novel feature in quantum mechanics, and uh, okay, there are questions that we cannot fully answer, and it needs further study. Now, if we really want to understand what's happening, we need to address certain questions which are deeper and more difficult. For example, how do we, uh, what is the, quant the theory of quantum measurement for the infalling observer? And uh, as uh, Daniel asked, um, so far, I gave you that uh, I, I, I showed that you can define these operators in a way that reproduce the smooth interior, but I didn't explain why this is the correct choice. So, in order to be able to do that, we have to understand quantum measurement in more detail. And a related question is that we have to understand time evolution for the infalling observer, uh, which is not so trivial because uh, the Hamiltonian for the infalling uh, for the infaller is not the same thing as the CFT Hamiltonian, and in particular, it's not clear whether the Hamiltonian for the infaller is state dependent or not. And if uh, the Hamiltonian is state dependent, then what is the principle which selects the Hamiltonian? Okay, 
So that's all I want to say about, uh, about uh, state dependence. Now, the other principle that I want to emphasize, which plays a role in this uh, story, is that of complementarity, which means that uh, the following. Uh, so this is, an, this is an old idea, of course, but here I will try to make it a little bit more concrete. We constructed these operators uh, because we restricted our attention to a small algebra, a small algebra of single trace operators. Now, uh, if you enlarge the small algebra by including more and more operators, uh, at some point, the construction which I explained before will break down. The, it will break down because the technical conditions will not be satisfied. For instance, I emphasize that we have to uh, uh, have the condition that uh, you cannot annihilate the state by elements of the algebra. If you make this algebra very large, then you can find annihilation operators which will annihilate the state, and then the construction of these operators will not work. Another way to think about it is that this commutator, which I said equal to zero, is not uh, zero as an operator equation, but rather it is uh, zero only when inserted in simple correlation functions. Or equi another equivalent uh, way to think about it is that the operators of tilde can be reconstructed as incredibly complicated combinations of the O's. So uh, in the case of the black hole, what this uh, seems to suggest is that um, uh, operators in the interior and the exterior of the black hole have a, a commutator which cannot be set exactly equal to zero, but you have to keep it, you have to have a lower bound which is estimated to be of the order of e to the minus s, whereas s is a black hole entropy. And moreover, uh, what this means is that in principle you can find complicated operators acting on the exterior which have a commutator with an interior operator with the order one. So this would be a very dramatic violation of locality, but in order to achieve that, you have to act with a very complicated operator. Now, uh, more generally, what this means is that the Hilbert space of quantum gravity does not factorize in two sectors, the interior and the exterior, and uh, the fact that the Hilbert space does not factorize solves the monogamy problem um, of entanglement because we do not have independent systems. And at the same time, it is consistent with bulk effective field theory because these commutators are really small. Now, um, in case you are bothered by this commutator uh, being non-zero, let me just say that uh, even if you try to uh, define what would be the alternative, namely what would be absolute locality, uh, absolutely local observables in quantum gravity, we do not know how to do that. So perhaps it's not so surprising that this commutator is non-zero. Second, um, this distinction between simple and complicated operators was very important for the emergence of, uh, of locality. But this raises some questions. For example, uh, what could be an example of a very complicated operator violating locality? Also, uh, if complementarity is a very general principle of quantum gravity, uh, could we study it uh, in a situation without a black hole? Uh, I mean, uh, d does it, can we study it in empty ADAs, for instance? And here is where I want to mention some work in progress. So we consider the following setup. We consider eight empty ADAs in global coordinates. And the safety dual is defined on, uh, on the cylinder. And we consider a, a, an interval in time in the conformal field theory uh, where this, the length of this interval is less than pi. I'm working in units where the radius of ADS is 1 and the radius of the sphere is 1. So in these units, pi is the light crossing time uh, for ADS. So if the, the length of this uh, ba time bound is less than pi, then you can see from this diagram that uh, this, this time bound naturally defines a causal diamond in the middle of ADS, where the points of this diamond are space-like relative to the boundary. Now, as you uh, decrease the length of this time bound, this diamond gets bigger, and if you increase it, it gets smaller. If the, the, this time bound is longer than pi, then th this diamond disappears completely. Now, from the bulk point of view, uh, this looks like uh, a spherical horizon. For if, you have, if you're an observer moving in, in region D, D bar, uh, it looks like a spherical horizon. Um, and if we, if we did not have gravity, then uh, this would imply that the Hilbert space uh, of the theory in the bulk factorizes into a sector corresponding to the interior and a sector corresponding to the exterior. Uh, or, uh, relatedly, the, al the algebras of operators in the interior and the exterior would be defined and they would be commuting. Now, when we include gravity, the situation is a little bit more complicated because we have to deal with issues of gauge fixing and gauss low tails. But uh, in some intuitive sense, and at large n, we expect that there should still be some sort of factorization of the Hilbert space into two sectors, the interior of the diamond and the exterior of the diamond. And now what we want to understand is what is the CFT interpretation of this uh, decomposition. And what I want to argue is that, again, uh, one way to understand it is by thinking in terms of simple and complicated operators. To explain it, uh, I need to uh, introduce a notion which is not very common. Um, usually when we talk about algebras of, of operators localized in space-time, uh, usually we talk about uh, um, 
algebras uh, localizing in, in small space like regions, I mean causal diamonds like this one. Um, but we do not talk about algebras of operators uh, defined over a band in time. The reason is obvious. Uh, the reason is that if you uh, include all operators which can be inserted in this time band, then basically you reproduce the entire set of operators in the, in the theory. For example, uh, using the Hamiltonian evolution, you can take any operator at later times and move it back into this uh, band. So in a, in a general quantum field theory, the notion of an uh, uh, algebra of operators in a time band is not so useful. However, uh, we, we are looking at a special class of theories, which is large and conformal field theories with a holographic dual. And as I mentioned earlier, in these theories, there are very natural hierarchy in the spectrum uh, of operators between single trace operators versus heavy operators. Or complicated, this should have been complicated operators. So in this case, we can define the small algebra of simple operators. Uh, uh, so this is very similar to what we did in the case of black hole, but now these operators are restricted to act in this uh, time band. So all this point, so we define a small algebra uh, characterized by the time band, which is defined by the all linear combinations of small products of single trace operators in the band. And um, it is clear from the bulk that uh, this simple algebra is related to bulk fields in the region D bar because they can be related by uh, the equations of motion, by a construction a la uh, hamilton kabat uh, low ellipsis. So then the question is, uh, what is the meaning of the operators inside the diamond D from the point of view of the, of the CFT? Now, in principle, as I said earlier, these operators should be uh, contained in the set of all operators which can be defined in this band. But they're not going to be simple operators, they're going to be complicated operators. So operators in the middle of the, of the, of the diamond uh, correspond to complicated operators instead of the time band, which uh, commute with the simple operators uh, in the larger limit. That's why we get this approximate locality in the bulk. So um, and it, 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 there are some similarities with the case of the black hole. Uh, as in the case of the black hole, the ground state of the conformal field theory appears to be entangled when you probe it by the small algebra, the small algebra of single trace operators, and uh, from the bulk point of view, this entanglement is rather clear. It's the entanglement between uh, the d bar and d. And you can also try to construct some sort of modular Hamiltonian, uh, which is not very easy to find because um, in this case, the horizon is not generated by an isometry. Uh, nevertheless, in the larger limit, we expect that the, uh, the modular Hamiltonian is going to be quadratic. So you can write down some f a, a, um, formal expression for this modular Hamiltonian in terms of the two-point functions. Here, in any case, um, what I want to argue now is that uh, this, um, the operators of this um, uh, inserted in this time band satisfy certain algebraic properties which are very similar to single trace operators acting on a black hole microstate. In particular, let's consider the Hilbert space of effective field theory excitations on top of ADS. So if you take um, a, bulk, a field in ADS, a scalar field, and you expand it in modes, the frequencies that you get are given by this formula. So they're quantized. And because of this quantization, uh, you can generate any state you want uh, by acting with boundary operators inserted in a time band of length pi, right? because, uh, because of this quantization. So the uh, effective field theory Hilbert space in the bulk can be constructed by the linear span of all possible states that you get by acting with single trace operators in a time band of length pi. So remember, our time band was shorter than pi, right? It, was, it had a length equal to t. So, uh, th Here's a claim. By acting with elements of a small algebra in uh, 0, t, you can actually generate the entire um, Hilbert space of effective field in the bulk. So you can even, by acting with single trace operators in this region, you can generate states that you could get by acting with operators in this uh, upper part. So this is a version of what is called the risk leader theorem in, in, uh, in quantum field theory, that you can get all states of the Hilbert space by acting in a restricted subset. But in this case, um, the domain that we're talking about is a, is, is a domain in time. Uh, so it is rather unusual. And it only makes sense because uh, uh, we're in a large and conformal theory, and we can introduce the notion of the small algebra. I think I have zero minutes. So um, OK, let me very briefly uh, explain what happens. So you can prove the statement by uh, following uh, a, a, an, an analytic proof, which is very similar to the risk leader theorem. Uh, so you can prove that uh, for any state that you get in the, in the bigger um, Algebra, sorry, uh, and yes, from the bigger time band, you can approximate it arbitrarily well by acting with operators acting in the small algebra, in the small time band, and you can prove that the, uh, the set of states of this form um, converges into states of that form. Um, you can also prove that um, 
you cannot find annihilation operators in the time band, which is another property, key property that you used in the case of the black hole. So the algebraic properties of this small uh, algebra acting on the time band are very similar to the algebraic properties of single trace operators acting on the black hole microstate. Um, and finally, operators in the interior of this diamond can be represented as complicated operators in the time band. And this can actually be done uh, rather explicitly uh, by taking the bulk field, expanding it in modes, and then you get these coefficients, which you can express in terms of the Hilbert space of the bulk theory. And as I told you before, each of these states can be arbitrarily well approximated by operators acting the small algebra. So all in all, uh, you get a formula which lo looks like this. So uh, the um, operator uh, at the center of the diamond can be written as a complicated expression where all of, of these x of i's of f's are uh, smeared operators, single trace operators on the time band. And the only ingredient which does not belong to the small algebra is this projector operator on the ground state, which is not a simple operator. It's not a single trace operator. OK, uh, I'm sorry, I went a little bit fast here. Uh, what I want to say is that the operators in the interior of the diamond can be represented as complicated operators on the boundary. And uh, while these guys commute with simple local operators in the time band, they do not compute with complicated ones. So there is some, some toy model, of, some toy version of complementarity in this, in this story. OK, uh, let me summarize. I try to uh, emphasize that reconstructing the black hole interior is an outstanding problem in ADCFT, and uh, it may have implications for the black hole information paradox. And I also mentioned the specific proposal based on state dependence. And uh, this proposal realized the idea of complementarity. And a, a key property of this uh, proposal is the distinction between simple and complicated uh, operators. And uh, it may be that uh, we can find a toy model where a similar uh, distinction is important in order to understand locality in the bulk. Uh, happy birthday, Davis. <laughs> Uh, in some sense, yes. No, not exactly, though. Uh, are, you, are you talking about uh, whether we use this modular theory or...? Um uh, in some sense, not exactly. If you, if you apply it blindly, um, because uh, in this case, uh, the two parts of, this of the system are not symmetric. I mean, usually we have symmetric uh, decomposition, like in Rindler space or in the black hole case. In this case, the two regions, the diamond and the complement, are not symmetric. So if you apply the, the procedure blindly, it's not guaranteed that you will get an operator in the commutant which will behave like a local field. Yeah, so if you really want to get local fields in, in, in D, then you have, to be, you have to do it by hand to some extent. Yes? By including Willi or like Wilson loops, for example, or yeah, that's a very good question. But uh, yeah, w I have to think about it more. We haven't thought about it yet. I try to concentrate on black holes in ADS. Uh, so uh, I'm so I'm not sure what you mean. So um, these comments were for black holes uh, which evaporate. So th th these were. This is the part. The firewall part. No, no, that was for a black hole in ADS. Oh. So, I, and for a big black hole in ADS. So, it, it's a stable black hole. Thank you.